Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Russell Korobkin. I'm the Dean of the UCLA School of Law. Uh, this is an event today that I've been really excited about, and I'm glad that you could join us. This is the first installment of the Safeguarding Democracy Project Spring, Sem Spring Semester Webinar Series, and we are very pleased to kick off the series with Rachel Maddow. I expect that Rachel needs no introduction from everyone here, but you might not know that in her new podcast series entitled Ultra, uh, she explores a little known episode of United States history when a conspiracy among pro-Nazi members of Congress created a serious threat to American democracy. Rachel will be joined today in conversation by UCLA law professor, Rick Hassan. As I think uh, all of us know well, uh, Rick is our internationally recognized expert in election law. He's been an election law analyst for CNN, NBC, and MSNBC, and he's the founder and director of our Safeguarding Democracy Project. So with that, let me turn it over to Rick. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Karopkin, uh, for the warm introduction. And I too would like to uh, welcome everyone uh, to the first in our spring webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project at UCLA Law. I want to thank Harley Hamm for her important logistical support today. And I want to tell you about the upcoming programs of the project. All of these programs are free, but registration is required. On February 16th at noon Pacific, we'll be in conversation with Professor Jake Grumbach on his book, Laboratories Against Democracy. This is an online only program. On March 2nd at noon Pacific, I'll be in conversation with Professor Joan Donovan about her book, Meme Wars, The Untold Story of Online Battles Upending Democracy in America. This event will be online, but also live at the UCLA Law School. On March 17th, SDP will be hosting an all-day conference on the UCLA Law campus entitled, Can American Democracy Survive the 2024 Elections? Uh, details will be posted soon. I'm very excited about the Tremendous lineup of speakers. This event will be both in person and online. And finally, on April 4th at noon Pacific time, I'll be speaking online with Colorado Elections Director Judd Choate and the Brennan Center's Liz Howard on the topic, confronting the insider threat on election security and protecting election officials. Uh, again, all of these events are free, but registration is required. Sign up. Uh, for these events on the Safeguarding Democracy Project website at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. For those of you watching live, there's a link in the chat. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome journalist Rachel Maddow to talk about lessons for democracy in the United States from her amazing podcast series, Ultra. Uh, Rachel is the host of the Emmy-winning Rachel Maddow Show on MSNBC, it's the most. It was the most successful launch in MSNBC history. Uh, it has won three Emmy awards. Matto is also the author of *Drift: The Unmooring of American Military Power*, which debuted number one on the New York Times bestseller list in 2012. Her book *Blowout: Corrupted Democracy, Rogue State Russia, and the Richest, Most Destructive Industry on Earth* was released in 2019. *Ultra*, a production of MSNBC and NBC News, is an eight-episode podcast that examines the history of seditious plot to undermine American democracy 80 years ago and the wild fight in and out of the courtroom to stop it. The series was produced by Maddo and uh, the former Rachel Maddo show producer, Mike Yarvitz and Maddo producer, Kelsey Desiderio. This is the second original podcast from Maddo and Yarvitz following their hit series, Bagman, which earned the DuPont Columbia Award. It debuted at number one on Apple Podcasts in October and stayed there for four straight weeks. Uh, I begin today uh, uh, with my own uh, set of questions, but I invite you to submit questions using the Q&A function on the Zoom, uh, at, at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, I'll try to get to those questions near the end. A and with that, uh, Rachel, uh, welcome. It's, it's so great to have you here today. Rick, it's great to see you. This is um, very, very, very exciting to me. So I'm really pleased. And all the other stuff that you're doing in forthcoming weeks uh, makes me feel very intimidated by the company. Uh, well, we're glad to have you here. And I like turning the tables. And uh, this is uh, interviewing the interviewer. Yeah. Um, let me just begin. Not everyone has had a chance to listen to uh, your, what I consider to be a riveting podcast uh, called Ultra. Could you briefly just set the stage 
and describe the, the period of time and the instance that it covered and the overall arc uh, of the story. Sure. Um, we start episode one um, in on on Labor Day weekend of 1940, and we sort of wrap up in 1944. But there's a little bleed on both sides of that time arc, um, and basically, it's the story of um, what was going on in that time in American history, in the immediate run up to World War II, and to a certain extent during World War II, that we have forgotten about because it's politically uncomfortable, I think, to think about. Um, when we look back now at um, American sociopolitical history during World War II, I think we look at it at a time of unity and in fact sort of simplicity in our purpose, that there was a real bad guy overseas who we were all agreed should be fought. And we went over there and fought them and beat them and made the world um, safe for democracy and crushed the fascists. And while there's a, certainly an element of truth in that, there is this other story about Americans who believe that we either shouldn't fight Hitler or that if we were gonna fight in World War II that we should fight on Hitler's side. Um, and there was a surprisingly large amount of political organizing in the United States of pro-fascist and sort of proto-fascist groups that were trying to soften America up for Hitler's eventual invasion or indeed to set us up with a fascist government here. And then the sort of core of the story is the surprising links between those fascist movements and people with a lot of political power. There were at least two dozen members of Congress who were involved in a now forgotten scandal where they were working with an agent of the Hitler government to spread Nazi propaganda to the American people using Congress and the franking privilege and the free mail privileges that members of Congress get. Um, there was an effort in the Justice Department to go after both of those things, the members of Congress involved in that plot and the violent fascist groups in the country that wanted to overthrow the government. And it, the, that effort by the Justice Department failed. Um, and this podcast is that story. Oops. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, it, it wouldn't be a Zoom conversation without someone forgetting to unmute. Um, uh, <laughs> So you know, the, as you mentioned, uh, the ultra opens with the death of this uh, U.S. Senator Ernest Lundeen in a mysterious plane crash in 1940. Um, that leads to this um, series of threats to American democracy. It's a pretty dramatic moment, but what struck me is, uh, you know, maybe I'm particularly ignorant, but it's 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 an episode I I knew nothing about, yeah. uh, and indeed. Many of the instances you recount in the book were essentially lost to American history. So first, I'm interested just as a matter of curiosity of how you stumbled onto this uh, uh, this episode and decided it was something worth producing. Uh, but um, more significantly, uh, they say that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Hmm. Um, what does it say to you? This is not that old, right? There are yeah. still people alive from this era, many people. Uh, what does it say to you about American politics and culture that this period of um, real sedition, I don't, I don't think that's an exaggeration to use that word, a period of real sedition has essentially been erased from, from our consciousness? It's, I think, one of the most interesting things to think about related to this whole episode. Why, why is it that nobody knows this? It's, it's not um, uh, been conspired it's not been suppressed by some cons conspiracy, right? There hasn't been an, an, an agency pushing this down the memory hole on purpose, but for a variety of reasons, we've really forgotten about it. And I think it is because they're really, until now, until the sort of obvious allegories that we're living through now, which I think are giving people like me reasons to look to the past to see if there's any precedent in our history that we can learn from, other than that, there hasn't been hasn't been convenient for anybody to look at this. For the Justice Department, for example, um, this was a big failure, um, and there they brought a massive trial over many of these defendants. Nearly thirty people brought to trial in 1944, the biggest sedition trial in U.S. history, and it was a disaster from day one and collapsed in a in a, in a very chaotic mistrial. Um, the Justice Department doesn't want to remember itself that way. Um, from the point of view of the defendants, the 
the, the, the evidence against them, I think particularly the evidence that emerged during trial, that they were not only ultra-right violent groups in the United States plotting the overthrow of the US government, but they were getting support from the Nazis in Germany to do it. I think that means that it makes it very hard for the defendants and their supporters, their would-be supporters to stick up for them. And so they don't mind that it's forgotten. And then when it comes to the members of Congress who are implicated, that I think might be the most interesting thing because while the Justice Department effort to uh, bring about a reckoning for these guys in the courtroom failed, it did create a lot of publicity at the time. And the consequence for these members of Congress was political. Almost to a one, they were all voted out, including members of Congress who were very, very, very powerful, who were household names of their day. By the time the podcast ends, Harry Truman is president. His mentor from when he had been in the Senate is one of the senators who is implicated in this plot. He was the most famous senator in the country for a decade. But when there was political accountability and the, and the American people, and in some cases their political parties threw them out, that sort of made them disappear. Um, and we don't remember them either as having been famous, nor do we remember them in an ongoing way in terms of learning the lessons of their demise. And that's an interesting thing about political accountability is that it does make you obscure. Um, with the exception of, you know, Richard Nixon or Benedict Arnold, like we, 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 we don't think of bad guys as much as in terms of our continuous political history, as much as we think of our heroes. Um, and so if you're a bad guy and you pay the price for something that you've done, you may well be forgotten. And it may be somebody 80 years down the road like me who has to dig up your story. And just to follow up, how did you dig up this story or how did you come upon it? So I am... Uh, I have been interested for a long time in what I think is now, now kind of a widespread topic of discussion, which is rising anti-Semitism in the United States, the links between anti-Semitism and the ultra-right. But specifically, I've been interested in Holocaust denial, um, which for all the terrible things that it is, it's also absurd. Um, particularly it was absurd in the 1940s when there were lots and lots and lots of eyewitnesses in America, including tens of thousands of GIs who had seen with their own eyes the implications of what the Nazis had done in a way that was undeniable. And the refugees who were here, and I mean, it wasn't a secret. We had the Nuremberg trials and we had the Nazi records. So for us to have American Holocaust denial in the late 1940s was just strange. And it turns out there's a very strange, specific, personal story as to where Holocaust denial came from in this country and why. And when I was planning to do a podcast about that, I realized I had to kind of learn where these characters came from. And in so doing, I came across the defendants in the sedition trial and it blew my mind and I started learning more about it. And then when I learned about the um, our sort of hero prosecutors in the story, John Power Maloney and um, John Raggi, uh, or William Power Maloney and John Raggi. When, when, I, when I learned about them, I knew that I had to stop what I was doing, plan to do that other thing later and, and tell the story of this trial. Well, it does sound like there'll be a sequel. Um, uh, thinking about it. <laughs> is, the, is the term ultra related to the ultra virus argument that you make near the end of the book? It's uh, a couple of, it plays a couple of ways. One, it is about what I, uh, it is about ultra virus, right? Which is a Latin concept in the law, which is you're acting outside your, authority, which um, one of our hero prosecutors, John Raggi, definitely does. And so I was hoping by highlighting the um, inappropriate nature of what he did that might otherwise seem heroic, I was hoping to kind of draw out the complexity of the moral choice that he makes at the end of the podcast, um, where he really does break the rules and he really does get fired for a good reason. And you're cheering for him the whole way because you understand why he's doing it. But the other part of it is to talk about the type of movement that I'm um, was trying to elucidate. And I, I, I do think that there, it's worth distinguishing um, ultra-right politics from far-right politics. And I know that sounds just like I'm shading the difference, but we don't use the term ultra very often right now. I think it's sort of become ultra MAGA is becoming a thing. But for me, the distinction there is um, closer to the way we used it to talk about like Japanese ultranationalists in the 1940s and 1930s and the 1940s, which is politics that are so far off the number line, they're against politics. They're about the end of political parties, the end of political processes, and they're about rule by force. And so I'm trying to, I'm trying to say, yes, there's, there's resonance here to our current politics, but we should also see this as something that's qualitatively 
different. And when people are against politics, they're not just extreme, they're sort of ultra radical. Yeah, I'm gonna to wanna to come to the ties to today, which uh, obviously is very important for the work we're doing at the Safeguarding Democracy Project. But I, I do wanna ask you before we turn to the lessons for today, hmm. um, when I first started listening to the series and I hear about uh, Senator Lundeen, it sounds like the isolated in, uh, an isolated incident of a, of a guy who had Nazi sympathies and who's able to sneak into high office after he's uh, first fails politically. Uh, because of his views, and and then has this kind of remarkable resurrection. But as the series goes on, it turns out that the infiltration affected many members of Congress. I, I wasn't expecting the frank, franking privilege to uh, take such a dramatic turn. I'm waiting to see how Steven Spielberg turns that into um, <laughs> a moment in the movie with people writing letters in the courtroom. That was a kind of crazy uh, moment, I thought, uh, in, in the podcast. Um, but I'm just wondering how you think it is that the Nazis uh, directed from Germany, apparently, were so successful in getting support from both uh, both sides of the aisle, some very prominent people. But how did this happen? Was this um, primarily ideological? Or was it, um, uh, you know, was it was it, and if it was ideology, was it the ideology of non-intervention or was it actually the embrace of of extreme Nazi ideology? Like what explains not the, not the single um, extreme guy, but the breadth of this whole thing? It's a good question. And I do think that there is the, the large numbers of people who were in the Senate and the House who, who were part of this scheme kind of gives you a preview of the fact that you are going to need a, a bunch of different explanations for it, because I don't think it was one thing, what, any one thing that was motivating any of them. But um, certainly, I mean, part of it was that, I mean, Hitler's main goal, I mean, the Hitler government spent tens of millions of dollars in 1940 dollars on propagandizing the, the American people in the lead up to World War II. And they had a few different aims. One of them, um, and, and the primary one, was to discourage America from getting involved in the war. So non-interventionism was their main aim. They were also trying to sow what they called kernels of dissension. They were trying to weaken us as a society by making Americans distrust each other and distrust our system of government. And they were also trying to soften us up for fascism um, in case there was going to be an attempt at a fascist overthrow in, in this country. And they, those were sort of tiered goals for them. Um, and I think those tiered goals sort of matched up all three of them at certain levels with different members of Congress. Senator Lundin, who dies in the first episode in that plane crash, was a committed isolationist. Um, and he was an isolationist from World War I, and he was an isolationist in World War II, and had he lived, he probably would have been an isolationist for the, related to other wars too. Um, and so the members of Congress who felt like they were kind of losing the battle against Roosevelt, even though a lot of public opinion was with them, because the American, the American public by and large regretted us having been involved in World War I, they didn't want us involved in another world war, there was a lot of sentiment against it. And not all of that was racist or, or, or sympathetic at all to the German side or to any of the access powers. But getting a boost for your isolationist sort of underdog sentiment, I think, was motivating to some of them. Certainly, some of them were motivated by support for the things that Hitler stood for. I mean, there were definitely members of Congress who were virulently anti-Semitic and who liked that um, about the, the message that they were getting from the Germans or who were otherwise um, inclined toward authoritarian arguments. Lots of Americans were, lots of Americans are today. Um, the third thing though, which I think is small and petty and very understandable and sad, is a lot of them got paid. Um, this, this German agent who was working this scheme in Congress set it up so that members of Congress could make a lot of money by agreeing to work with him. And it was, you know, they would get stuff published in magazines and newspapers and stuff, and they'd figure out ways to get paid for it. He would publish their books. The German government was actually supporting his publishing house, and he would write the books, put a senator's name on it, and then de deliver them the proceeds while it was mailed out for free on a postage charge to the American taxpayers, thanks to franking. So, I mean, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot of different things. I also think that the Nazi agent who was running this thing was really charming and good at getting people to do what he wanted. Um, but there was really, there was nothing standing in his way. He was really pushing on an open door to get 
24 at least members doing what he wanted. I was also, I mean, this is a more minor point, but I was struck by how, um, you know, using the franking privilege, sending out free mail, that that mail was considered a major means of political communication. I mean, today, lots of people don't even check their mailboxes, like they won't answer their home telephone. Um, yeah. But it does, it does strike me that, um, you know, writing a, you know, a handwritten letter um, was much more powerful and, and delivering political messages by mail. Uh, more than just kind of like the slate mailer that we get here out in California with, you know, the names of a bunch of uh, people on, but actually trying to have reasoned argument by mail just struck me as very antiquated, but I guess that was the state of the art uh, at the time. Yeah. I mean, understanding it in context, this is at a time when there was no TV news. Um, radio news was a very specific slice of the way that a very, you know, that, that some people were able to do things, uh, some people able to access the news. It was newspapers and then there was this one other thing, which is that you could, if you're in a city, you could hand out handbills or sell newspapers on the street corner. And for reaching the rest of the country, it was the mailbox. And so it it seems like a, I think that that also might be part of the reason that some of this story wasn't told is that you look back at it and you think, you know, I'm sure 80 years from now, people are going to be look back and be like, Facebook memes, that wouldn't have had an impact, right? We look back and say direct mail, that wouldn't have had an impact. But the social media of its day, um, you know, it has has more has more weight. Let me just remind uh, those of you who are watching that if you have questions, uh, you can put them in the Q and A box, and I will try to get to them near the end. Uh, now I want to turn to uh, lessons, and I have kind of three sets of questions uh, in this area. Um, uh, the first uh, relates to listening to both Bagman, which I, I also enjoyed, which is, uh, you know, a story about personal graft and uh, and corruption related to Spiro Agnew, who's uh, Richard Nixon's uh, vice president, and Ultra, which is the story about sedition and disloyalty from top elected officials. You know, if some might say you're subtweeting Donald Trump, right, that there are some obvious parallels here, both, the, you know, the, the, the self-dealing part and also the sedition part. Um, but you hardly mention Trump. Um, I think there's a brief mention in the, maybe the last episode um, or an allusion to it. Um, I say that the America first branding has come back. Yes, that's the only right, thing that I mentioned. Right. Now. And that's another thing that I think is lost, that people don't really understand the, the historical implications of using America first. Um, yeah. Look um, that up before you say that you're going to name your pack America first. Yeah. Look up what that stood for. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, especially when you describe what the you know the the burning of documents in the dumpster behind the last America first. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, so, so was this intentional? Um, did you start these projects with Trump in mind? Did they just resonate with you more because of the moment we're in? So, uh, you know, I'm offering you kind of an opportunity to reflect on the connections between the historical work you're doing and the work you do when you're on TV reporting, say, the news of the day. Mm. Um, I, I, there isn't a, there isn't an easy answer to that. I mean, I, I think that certainly I'm cognizant of modern resonance with the stuff that I am interested in, in history. And, um, when we say something is unprecedented, often that is literally true. It is less often literally true than we think it is. Um, and I just, I feel like my job at MSNBC, my sort of job in my, in my day job is to help explain what's going on in the news. And I find it particularly valuable in terms of my own understanding of the news to really know whether something is unprecedented and to know whether previous times that we might have faced something like this in the past um, have anything to offer. I feel like one of the things that I have learned going, growing from a sort of bratty teenager to a slightly less bratty adult, I hope, is to recognize that my elders and people who went before me were smarter, funnier, more nimble, um, and braver, and all you know they were they were cooler than than I was, and I'd like to learn to be cool in the way that they were, and so I I I, I feel like um, you have to look for resonance both in the bad guys and in the good guys. Um, both in terms of like Americans who might have had good ideas for facing these kinds of threats before, um, but also looking at the consequences for what happens when people get away with stuff like this. I mean, we're thinking right now 
I think in some depth and in a pretty healthy national conversation about what it might mean for there to be criminal charges brought against a former president. We've never had that happen before. The closest we got to that was when sitting Vice President Spiro Agnew really did get he was facing a 40 count felony criminal indictment while he was serving as vice president. And the only reason he technically wasn't charged as vice president was because they weighed, they, they had him weigh that 40 count felony, you know, litany against what it would cost him to resign. And they took his resignation and essentially wiped almost all the felonies off the map in exchange for it. So he was never charged as a sitting um, office holder. It was, you know, they were two minutes apart. He was in the courthouse when they transmitted his letter of resignation so that we wouldn't have a legal precedent of charging a sitting vice president. That's, I, that just strikes me. If, if we're going to be weighing this about Trump now, we ought to know about the, the time we got closest to it before. It's not just about Nixon getting pardoned. It's about what happened to Agnew too. And appreciating that history and what it meant in terms of justice and future wrongdoing by presidents and vice presidents, when Agnew didn't have to go to jail and was essentially forgotten by history, that's, to me, that's crunchy, like that's granular, that's really helpful in terms of thinking about what might happen with the various steps that we're considering taking now. Um, and this leads me to thinking uh, more about ultra, um, the understanding of patriotism, and whether you can be an American patriot without being committed to the democratic aspect of American politics, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things that strikes me about both the current moment and the moment that you describe in Ultra is that um, there is this um, feeling of American nationalism that's not tied to we the people or, you know, or, or the constitution in any meaningful way. And I don't know if you saw those parallels, but I was thinking about that too, that, you know, someone who's saying America first and then says, you know, like, shut down democratic elections, hard to see how that's America first. It's this country, but it's not really America, at least as many of us understand it. Yeah, I mean, there has, there has been um, an active, explicit sort of through line on the right for a long time. Um, and I would say on, on the, both the far right and the ultra right, that America isn't a democracy. Uh, that we're a republic, not a democracy, and that we should see democracy as a form of weakness and as something that leads us inevitably towards socialism. Um, and it's why, you know, it that has a that intersects very quickly with um, with with fears around immigration and about naturalization um, and, and citizenship and voting rights. But the idea that America is something other than what is written in our constitution, the idea that we are a blood and soil contract country rather than um, a constitutional republic um, I set of ideals is I think kind of a fundamental like personality test difference in terms of what kind of Americans we are and how we define patriotism. I mean, you know, in, in 1934, um, Hitler, uh, the Hitler youth held a huge rally in, in Potsdam um, in, in Germany. And part of the reason that we know what that looked like is that there were Americans who were pro-fascist who went uh, and gloried in it. And um, this is before 1936, the huge Nuremberg rally. These were other rallies to which Americans went sort of as pilgrims to experience this thing firsthand. And what the Nazi party was showing off in 34 uh, to include an audience that included some Americans and then to 30 in 36 showing off to the world was this idea of a uniform looking population that could be organized sort of like North Korean gymnastics style in a way that could flex strength in an aggressive way towards the rest of the world and therefore had to be obeyed. And then they were going to take up more space and take over more, um, take over take over the rest of the world right they were going to have the, the the global reich and they were going to clean themselves up in the meantime so that their uniform blood and soil strength which they saw as their the way they were going to dominate was going to show the world the way and when the far right today <laughs> romanticizes america as something that ought to be that that ought to be strong in the same way 
that ought to be not diverse, that diverse, you know, you hear this argument, even on Fox News primetime, you know, the diversity isn't a strength, it's a weakness, and that we ought to be a Christian nation. And it's, it's all this idea of a sort of, um, uh, uh, ide not ideologically, but a, a demographically homogenous country that shows its strength that way. It's just, a, to my mind, it's barbaric, <laughs> but it's old. Um, it's been repeated in lots of different countries and it has recurring appeal. And to the extent that we've got people with political power who appeal to that or who play footsie with that, it's dangerous because it, it does appeal to people on a, on a sort of reptilian level. Um, and we know where it leads. I, I remember John Stewart, maybe over a decade ago, who was the first one that called to my attention the kind of romanticism of Putin by mm -hmm. uh, those on the right as a kind of strong man who represented what American um, uh, strength should look like, you know, that Americans were weak and that we should be strong. And, you know, you kind of see the through line from that into Trumpism. That, uh, and part of where that came from early on in, I mean, P Putin became the leader of Russia on, on, on Y2K, right? On December 31st, 1999. And part of the myth of Putin that started taking hold in the American right was when he, you know, crushed the Muslims in, the, in, in, in Russia. The idea that he was going to homogenize the, the proper Russian population in a way that would make Russia globally a white power, a Christian power, an Orthodox power. That's what appeals to the ultra right in the United States. Um, and it and it's only gotten worse. I promise I will get to the questions in a few minutes, but I want to get to what I think was my number one question, which is why I wanted to have you as part of this series, which is about the connection between um, the challenges we face when there's sedition and the ability to use law to hold people accountable. Uh, in some ways, I found that part of the podcast profoundly uh, disturbing. Um, you talk about two sets of legal failures uh, with two different prosecutors. Um, and um, uh, and the second set, uh, w w this kind of kangaroo court uh, with just some absurd behavior that if, you know, if it were in a movie, uh, lawyers would roll their eyes and say, no judge would ever let this happen. And yet yeah. a judge lets it happen and it, it, you know, ultimately leads apparently to the judge's death. I mean, it's just a kind of absurd. So can you just describe a little bit the two legal failures? And then more importantly, um, what does this say about the limits of the law of using legal process as a way of holding people to account? That obviously has a connection to today as both the Department of Justice and prosecutors in Fulton County, Georgia are thinking about potentially charging either former President Trump or those around him with crimes related to attempting to subvert the, the outcome of the 2020 election. So I, that, that's the, that, you know, that to me, that was the big negative takeaway was about the, the limits of the legal system. And maybe that's the 1940s and not today, but I, I, I don't, I'm not so sure. Well, it's, it's a, that's I'm glad that that's where the podcast landed with you because that's where I really wanted it to land. I think that is the big, that's the big takeaway for me from this is hearing John Rogge, who was the prosecutor in the sedition trial that fell apart in this catastrophic mistrial, um, hearing him say after the trial fell apart, going to the American public, literally going on a national speaking tour to the American public saying, don't count on the Justice Department to fix this problem. We have a real problem in this country. There are people allied with the German government, which we just defeated in wartime, but we defeated them. We didn't defeat their allies here at home, their agents here at home who are working to turn us into a mirror version of what Hitler was doing in Germany. And the Justice Department isn't up to the task of treating this as a criminal problem. We have to treat this more holistically. Um, and he said it much more sharply than that and in a much more compelling way than that. And he got fired from the Justice Department for doing it and went on to this very strange afterlife um, the rest of, in the rest of his career having, having done so. He just kind of blew up like a comet. Um, but the, the, I mean, in, in the specific, what you're describing, Rick, as the sort of kangaroo, the, the, the circus environment in that courtroom, some of that is... I, th I think the lessons have been learned actually in the judiciary. And we can see that this year 
in the prosecutions, the two successful convictions that the Justice Department has obtained on seditious conspiracy for two different groups of the Oath Keepers, right? The first trial was five and the second trial was four, I think. Um, originally, as far as I understand it, all those nine defendants from the Oath Keepers were all going to be tried at once in front of Judge Mehta in, in uh, DC federal court, um, DC district court. And it was the judge who said, space constraints in the courtroom, I will be the judge for both of these cases. You prosecution team from DOJ, you will be the prosecution team for both of these cases, but these will now be two different cases. I'm not gonna take on nine defendants at once. Let's break them into two groups. That was a smart move by Judge Feta, and we've now seen seditious conspiracy convictions for two of the defendants in the first trial and all four in the second trial. Um, and it was the same prosecution team and it was the same judge and he did have the same familiarity with the evidence, um, but it didn't sort of, uh, you know, it didn't decompensate in the way that they did back in, in 1944. The judge in 1944, who, as you alluded to, this may have killed him, um, he was in his 60s, he was a well-known figure, he was an FDR ally, he'd worked at the SEC, he'd been a former congressman, he was very well-known, seen as very intelligent, very well-respected. He was only in his second year as a judge, though, when he took on this trial with 30 defendants. And so it may have just been that he wasn't, a very, he wasn't very good at being a judge, even though he was a good man. And so that was, that was part of the failure. And so I feel like the Justice Department maybe has learned from those experiences a little bit. But then there's the broader question of whether or not what we're confronting here is a crime problem or whether what we're confronting here is a politics problem. Um, and it can be both. Um, if for political reasons you commit crimes, um, then you can be prosecuted for having committed those crimes. But when there's a larger political project at work driving those crimes. And the political project that is at work is about getting rid of the rule of law, overthrowing the government. So there is no we the people to bring charges against any of you defendants. When there is an effort to use violence, force, intimidation, and threat to get rid of the lawful uh, means by which we govern ourselves and, and prosecute crimes, there has to be a political answer to that as much as there is a as much as there is a criminal answer to it. In, if you charge somebody with sedition, one of the things you run up with right away is the First Amendment, that people have the right to both think and say absolutely terrible things. The right to assembly means that you have the right to assemble with terrible people for terrible purposes. <laughs> and there's a limit to all of those things, but our constitutional protections, which you know, I don't think any of us want to erode, do protect us from these kinds of prosecutions, except in very, very, very extreme cases. But if only the extreme cases are held um, to some kind of account, then we end up in a situation where our, our, our form of government and the rule of law itself is constantly under violent threat. It's funny, right? you know, your, your argument is exactly the uh, opposite of Mitch McConnell's, right, who did not vote to convict Trump at the impeachment trial and said, this is a matter for prosecutors. Um, yes. You know, so that says, you know, maybe you have to use law when people don't have the political courage to do what they need to do, um, yeah. even if it's going to be secondary. Or, or now the debate over whether there should be an attempt to try to exclude Trump from the ballot and under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment that says that people who participate in an insurrection uh, can't run for office. Um, that seems politically dicey to do right now and deprive people of their choice, you know, let them have it at the ballot box. But, you know, maybe there is this legal path, but that that political moment seemed to have been, uh, you know, at the at the time of impeachment and, and the, the buck was passed. Uh, the buck to was the passed prosecutors. to exactly to the court system. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see if um, former President Trump is brought up on charges either in Georgia or in um, in, in the federal courts. It'll be interesting to see whether Mitch McConnell still thinks that's the right venue for uh, redressing these wrongs. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that it's important to see that the threat of fascism, the threat of ultra right politics, which is not just about extremism, which is about trying to get rid of democracy, is a recurring threat um, and is something that we have faced before. We, I believe, are facing it now. I believe we will face it again. And we need to be open-minded about the fact that we can't count on a sort of white knight prosecutor fixing it. 
um, there needs to be a big, a big response to it. And I think one of the, you said that this is kind of a depressing part of the podcast. I think that's right. But I think the sort of counterbalance to that, the heartening part of it is that by the Justice Department taking this on the way they did in the 40s, it did get a lot of publicity. And there was a lot of uh, journalism that gave it publicity, both in book form, magazine form, and, and print journalism, um, and actually radio journalism too. There was a lot of public attention to it, and the public attention to it itself caused a form of accountability when the American public and political parties voted out the people who were associated with the worst of this behavior. That's good. That's, that's not... It's not, you know, nobody's at the pearly gates casting somebody out, but it's, it is, it is a form of, it is an answer. It is. An yeah, answer. I, I had a piece in the New York Times over the summer saying that uh, although there are lots of risks of prosecuting Trump, including the risk that he could be acquitted, because if there's going to be a jury, there could well be at least one person who would uh, acquit him of uh, crimes related to the 2020 uh, attempted election subversion. There's also a risk of not prosecuting because that sends a signal that people can act with impunity to the extent yeah. you think of these things as crimes. Yeah, but, I mean, Adam Schiff actually made that point, I thought very well during the second impeachment he, when he said, and I'll paraphrase here, but he said something along the lines of, you know, it, it can't be that you try to violently overthrow the government. And if you fail, nothing happens. But if you succeed, you get to be dictator for life. Like the, that can't, that, that's a terrible set of incentives for anybody else who might consider this right. in the future. Um, there has to be some consequence for trying and, and failing. Failing itself can't be its own, can't be the only answer. Right. So the last set of questions I have before I turn to the audience questions has to do with the role of journalists, uh, then and now. Uh, so, you know, another one of the heroes in the story is Dillard Stokes, who's doing a Watch Post reporter. He's, it's like really old fashioned shoe leather. He's staking out this place and he, he, he uncovers this uh, seditious conspiracy, um, literally the burning of documents and, you know, men driving around in cars, dumping things and, and all of that. Um, uh, th that's a more uplifting part of the story about, you know, journalists playing this uh, role as um, uh, a checking a checking function on the government and uh, 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 keeping people accountable. It seems that things have changed a lot today. We have a much more partisan press. We have this, um, you know, the rise of social media. Truth itself is hard to find. Um, um, many Republicans believe the false claim that the 2020 election was stolen. Um, many Democrats still believe, you know, uh, that there that there was a smoking gun evidence of collusion with Russia. When I uh, uh, um, shared the announcement that you were going to be coming on. They said, "Oh, Rachel Maddow, she's the one that spreads the false claim that the uh, that there's collusion uh, between Trump and Russia." So I'm just wondering, in this environment, whether journalists can still play an important role in that checking function in helping to assure American democracy. Oh, absolutely. I mean. Uh, you know, present company accepted. <laughs> I don't want to talk about myself in this context, but I think that, I mean, I think that journalism is um, is the best thing that we've got in terms of making sure that we don't have to rely on an official truth, that we get um, the facts independently verified by people who are trained professionals, who work with editors, who follow journalistic standards are held to account by their peers and by the public and who know how to ferret out real information even when people in power don't want it known. I mean, that's that's a that's a great system. Everybody everybody ought to have that. <laughs> and you can't really have a democracy without it. Um, and so, you know, the press has always taken their lumps and you can either, you know, deride the press for what you perceive to be their their you know their their own biases or you can deride the press for um, telling you truths that you don't want to hear or you can deride the press for their style or for their the business model of the press or whatever it is and uh, journalism and journalists have, have taken that since there's been journalism and journalists um, but at core you need people digging up true stories that people in power and people involved in those stories don't want told. And that's what journalism does when it's doing its best work. And so, um, I mean, the, the thing that I worry the most about is not criticism of journalists and criticism of 
you know, whether it's individual journalists like me or individual journalistic entities like MSNBC where I work or, 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 or journalism, journalists somehow being a, 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 a bad thing to be, which I think is a lot of what you hear. Particularly True enemy of the people is. The the enemy of the people, right. Um, I, I worry less about that than I do about whether or not there are paying good, there are paying full-time professional jobs in journalism at every level. Um, we can't, people do a form of citizen journalism when we participate in constructive uh, fact-based so social media iterative processes. Um, but having people who are trained as journalists, who follow journalistic standards, who are accountable to editors and who make corrections when they get things wrong and that kind of basic stuff, that needs to be a, that needs to be a profession in this country. And that, I, I worry about that more than I worry about the brick bats. Do you worry about the public having a harder time figuring out who is following those professional norms? Because, you know, anybody can create uh, a website that looks as slick as, uh, you know, the New York Times website, and it could be filled with propaganda. And we know that the Russian government has actually been involved in doing some of those things. Democratic Party and the Republican Party are both supporting what look like little local journalistic uh, efforts, but are actually ways of trying to promote their candidates. Uh, you know, do, do you think people have the tools or do they just throw up their hands and say, uh, I can't tell what truth is, so I'm not going to believe anything? Well, that's also I mean, it's a little bit like the, the 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 you know, what's the solution to hate speech or, you know, to bad free speech or more free speech. I mean, I, I sort of think that's a challenge for journalism, too, um, to honestly report on fake journalism uh, and stuff that is purporting to be journalism that's not, to report on propaganda, particularly when it's masquerading as news, and to distinguish itself. It's part of, it's it's the modern challenge in, in, in what we do. You know, but it's funny, looking back like at this era from ultra, looking back in the 40s, um, you know, a lot of the quote unquote mainstream journalism, the, the, the prestige press of its day, was trash it was just <laughs> was trash um and was absolutely you know party party organ of of extremist publisher x um including some stuff that was nazi propaganda that was willingly published in in u.s broadsheets at the time um you know th this isn't there's you know there's there there there's evolution in technology but i don't think that the challenges are are qualitatively different all right, let me turn to some of the uh, questions that uh, there's some great questions here. Uh, I'm just going to pick a, a few since we don't have that much time. Um, this one kind of asks about the psychological aspect of all of this. What have you learned about the dynamics of denialism, such as the role of cognitive dissonance and rationalization? You know, what are the parallels to the kind of denialism and the rise of conspiracy theories today? Hmm. So that's that, I guess, kind of much more about what, you know, what was going on in the society in the 1940s compared to, to now. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is a clear through line that we can all understand and that I think we ought to articulate more often because I do think it gives people a good like sort of personal firewall on on conspiracy theories and on different forms of scapegoating and prejudice, which is when you have decided that there is an other somewhere that is secretly controlling things and running things in a way that disempowers you and everybody, it doesn't matter what political choices you make because it's all being controlled by the Illuminati or the Jews or the whatever it is, um, or the, you know, the elite or the woke, blah, 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 whatever, whatever the, the term is of the day. One way to recognize that as, as um, enervating conspiratorial thinking is to take it to its next step, which is the point of those sorts of tirades is to make you think that your actions don't matter and therefore you should not act in a way that participates inside the system. Um, and I just, right, if, if it's, if there's some, if there's, there's some distant power that you can always, that you can blame for all the ills in the world, A, it's probably not true, and B, that's designed to shut you up. And so I, I, I feel like to the extent that we can sort of keep that front of mind, that these things have a real function at disengaging people and enervating people and making people think uh, cynically that nothing they do matters, um, that's a, that's somebody who's working against you who's trying to sell you that kind of a worldview. So that that I think is a constant. That's a through line that's been helpful for me to get real clear about. Uh, There's a related question about whether we're always going to face a threat of uh, extremism, ultra nationalism, uh, or, or whatever um, 
in, in some form like is this part of the human condition is this part of is there a through line through all of, of American history I mean it may be part of the American condition honestly I mean we are a multiracial multiracial egalitarian democracy and to the extent that that is psychologically unsettling to people who don't want to be part of a multiracial egalitarian democracy in which people who you don't like and who aren't like you and who you don't trust get as much of a say as you do, then that is always going to crack the door open for this appeal to uh, you know magical thinking about some glorious past in which the only people around were the people who were just like you and decisions were easy and if we only didn't have all these other people messing up the decision-making process and we just had one great leader who agrees with me, who's looking out for the country, who's inspiring my super patriotism, that would be better. I mean, that, that sort of longing, I think, is at core kind of a fear-based racial longing um, that uh, I think white people in particular in the United States will be recurrently susceptible to in significant numbers. Um, but it's not fate. I mean, the fact that you get people interested in that stuff from time to time, you know, you you cope with it. I think I think it would be helpful for us. I think it would be constructive for us as a country to get more conversant with the facts of um, previous generations that have contended with fight, with fights like this before. So it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel so overwhelming. It doesn't feel like we need to invent it all anew every time these sort of crises arise. You know, learn the story of the, uh, you know, read Charles Gallagher's book, Nazis in Copley Square, about the amazing Catholic lay activists who were grossed out by what the Catholic fascists were doing who were following Father Coughlin and how they fought them and exposed them in the streets of Boston and ultimately came out victorious. It, there was nothing superhuman or, or even powerful about, uh, you know, connected to power about any of the people who were the good guys in that story. It was just regular Americans who didn't want their city to go that way. It's very empowering. It's very moving. Yeah, anyway. that, was a, that was a much more uplifting part of the story than, than the yeah. trials. Yes, wow. exactly. I mean, the regular regular Americans in their everyday lives have made great strides against forces like this in the past, and we can do so again. Uh, well, I mean, I would point to the uh, political defeat of election deniers who ran for office of Secretary of State in those swing states. I mean, some won in, in uncontested races, you know, where they're essentially running in safe uh, Republican states, but you did see the the defeat of election denial ca candidates and. Uh, there was a recent Arizona Republic analysis of votes for Carrie Lake, and she got many fewer Republican votes than um, other Republicans who were running, who were not running on a denialism platform. So it does suggest that this stuff does break through. And, and it brings me to this next question, which is, how much do you think your podcast can um, attract those who who otherwise might have you know partisan leanings to the right uh, there was there was one uh, I'll just add my own point here uh that there's there's a uh, a right leaning uh law professor on Twitter that I follow who I respect a lot who said you know I'm not a, a great Rachel Maddow fan but I learned a lot from this podcast hmm. and so I'm wondering do you think that this can break through and um, get people to see those or is it or is it too subtle I mean, I don't know. I, I'm heartened by the success of this podcast. And actually, I was heartened by the success of, of Bagman as well, um, which after all is about a Republican villain, but it wasn't a particularly, it wasn't a story about partisanship. It was a story about um, good guys and bad guys and bad guys getting into power. Um, I, I do think that good stories um, and, and true history um, real facts that you can back up and illuminate and footnote and all those things. I, I do think that they have an appeal to anybody who's open-minded um, and wants to learn. It's part of the reason that I'm really attracted to this type of storytelling. Um, I think there's lots of lots of points of entree for um, people who have all sorts of different levels of interest in this stuff. So I hope, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think very much about who the audience is or might be when I'm making these things. I'm just trying to make the story as good as I can. But whenever I hear that somebody who's otherwise disinclined toward me <laughs> was able to get to the story anyway and find value in it, it does, um, does make my heart sing a little bit. Well, Rachel Maddow, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really uh, illuminating conversation. I, I appreciate it so much.
Rick, thank you. And I would just, I would just, before we go, I would just say what you were just sort of surprisingly underperformed in places like Arizona. That is a that is the product of the American people deciding that an election denialism is not for them. But it's also the product of the kind of work that you do, which is to take incredible, very high level expertise and talk about it in a way that is colloquial and understandable to just you know people who are otherwise watching the news who wouldn't get academic expertise like you otherwise have. Your willingness to be a public expert on subjects like this in a way that makes this stuff so understandable has a civic impact and helps people make better decisions. And so that's as much a product of the kind of work that you've done as a public intellectual um, as any of us have done in journalism. So thank you for your work too. Oh, well, now, now you're making me blush, but uh, yeah. thank you. I appreciate those <laughs> words. We are we are trying. And, and you can find out about all of our programs at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Our next program is going to be on March 2nd. I'm sorry, on February 16th with Professor Jake Grumbach and his book, Laboratories Against Democracy. Uh, on behalf of everyone here at UCLA Law School, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.